Welcome to Sunday Brunch here at Coffee and Tequila. My name is Zachary Patton Garcia. And I'm Alistair Patton Garcia. This episode is kindly being sponsored by Helix Sleep, as always, and we'll let you know a little bit more about them a little bit later. But because this is brunch, Sunday, fun day, um, we need drinks and we don't have mimosas. What I do have for you today okay. is the Brooks Shields. So this drink is inspired by her movie... Uh, the Blue Lagoon. Okay. We're going to be covering the Brooke Shields documentary today, uh, Pretty Baby. And yesterday we watched it. Uh, it's like two parts, an hour each part. So they really could have just put it into one movie and just made it a two-hour movie. They really could have, I don't know why they split it up into two parts, but it was on... Uh, it come out at the same time, I think, too. It was on Peacock. Or is it Amazon? It was on Hulu. Hulu. <laughs> Can't get them straight anymore. Honestly, there's so many damn streaming services that we might as well just go back to cable. You know what they need? They need like one single platform that'll just... They can put... Every all the content on every single bit of content instead of like subdividing all of the content onto different streaming platforms, just all the content on one platform. Like you know how everybody's like rewatching Vanderpump Rules right now, and yeah. so like if uh, somebody people go to and click Vanderpump Rules, well that those watches and those uh, th that money and I'll add revenue, everything connected to whoever's watching that just goes to whatever network is. Uh, you know what they call that, right? Shut the fuck up. It's called cable. It's, <laughs> we, 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 we've come to a time where we are now... <laughs> we were like, we don't want cable anymore. We're going to split off and do all these streaming services. And now we have so many streaming services that we might as well bundle so, them. I feel so foreign at this point. I'm always, it's just like, just, we just need one one platform. You know, something like a like a, like a a TV guide, you know. Yeah, we, went like to, a, we went around the circle, <laughs> and now we're back at a at cable. Cable and the TV guide is going to be the new revolutionary thing. <laughs> Watch in the next five years. Well, we even try to, we got like Fubo, which is kind of like cable for a little bit to watch. Did you pause that? I got an email that you paused it. I did pause it. Mm. So we have it for the rest of the month. Okay. Um, but uh, I, I paused it after that. Because I got Vanderpump to watch. I got Vanderpump. Well, you can watch it for the rest of the mm. month. <laughs> I don't know how many episodes there are going to be, okay? <laughs> this reunion could be four? like four episodes. I don't know. Well, we also have Peacock, yeah. so guess what? We don't have to watch it live. I have to watch it the day after. <laughs> yeah. This is terrible. This is terrible. <laughs> First off, what did you know about Brooke Shields? Okay, let's do like a KWL chart. What you know, what you want to know, and what you learned. Okay, so What did you know about Brooke Shields? I feel so bad because I thought Brooke Shields was on like One Tree Hill <sighs> or something. <laughs> Brooke, you're talking and about then, Brooke. That is Sophia Bush. And then, and then we started watching the uh, the the documentary, and I was like, "Oh my gosh, uh, sh she's from uh, uh, a Castle for Christmas." <laughs> <laughs> well, not a castle. I didn't grow up when Brooke Shields was like the teen teen sensation. Brooke Shields, right? In the seventies, eighties, like the eighties. She like really ruled the eighties, right? And so um, I remember when I was a kid watching my first time ever seeing her was watching Blue Lagoon on. TV and I remember well, watching. I had seen Blue Lagoon, yes, but I I, I never connected both thought of them. Thought of she yes. was, okay. Well, I yes. I did remember her because she's like got a very specific, distinctive face. Do you need to shake that? I do need to shake it. Okay, go Sh ahead. Uh, shake. Oh gosh, Alistair's alternative shake. Pause for effect. Okay, we got two on the Drew Barrymore show. This shit is done already. I know. I need. I think for for now on, I'm gonna I'm gonna have him done, and I might do a, like a different like segment. Mm. Well, so so um, I remember when I was a kid watching Blue Lagoon on TV, and just being obsessed with that movie. Right, just for a little bit. I was. It wasn't like a mega like a hyper fixation for me, but I was. I loved that movie, and I really wanted to. Cause I really wanted to be an actor when I was a kid or like a singer or something, you know, something to show biz. Um, I'd like bounce between the two and I really wanted to be in that movie. I was like, I want to be in blue lagoon too. <laughs> That's what I want to do. Cause it was like a teen fantasy movie, right? Like teenagers would watch Teens it. loved it. Teens. If a kid saw it, cause I was a kid and I was like in, in, obsessed with it. I remember her from that. And then I, but I really remembered her from, um, from the two thousands when, when, she came out and talked about postpartum depression. I remember that was a really big story, and I remember watching that with my mom. and And then I remember Tom Cruise like really going in at her, and we'll talk about that. Yeah, also, you were telling me about that. Well, they talked about made that. Made me in the think that her and Tom Cruise, because he was giving me like kind of surface details. Yeah. So I was thinking that Tom Cruise and her had dated. I don't think. No, I don't. So think I was so waiting either. for it in the documentary. Yeah, I don't think so. If they did, then I don't. I don't know. Um, okay, but yes. Yeah, so walk, talk us through this drink. Is this done? We yeah. need like skewers that we could put over top. I, with, uh, that's what I was thinking while I was making it. Needs to be um, like a little bit but more islandy. It's one and uh, it's one and a half parts blue curacao, uh, half uh, part vodka, uh, two parts coconut cream, uh, one part 
uh, house made simple syrup and a half part fresh lime juice. So what do you think? That tastes like a an ocean water from Sonic, but like really good. Because you know how they came out with their like little alcoholic seltzers. Yeah, uh, those weren't good, but this is very good. I, I actually is, did like their seltzers. This is this I dig this. This is this is exactly my drink. I like a little fruity, a little tropical, a little breezy. It is very breezy. It is very blue lagoon. Blue lagoon, if you will. Um, yeah. So uh, this episode is kind of being sponsored by Helix Sleep. Before we get into the documentary. Um, Helix Sleep, we've been working with them for nearly three years now, and we have two Helix Sleep mattresses. We love both of them. We have a queen size and we have a king size. We're about to switch back over to the king size, I think. Um, I think by switch the way, back over to- <laughs> we, we have them on scheduled rotations because you're about to leave again. And so, with- <laughs> again, and when he does leave, when he comes back, I think we should scoot back over into the king size bed, boot scoot and boogie into boot, it, boot, 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 boot scoot and boogie. Yeah, let's do it. Mm. I'm actually really looking forward to our king size bed now. You should just take a helix sleep to the field. Can we get you a helix sleep in the field? Just take send you one. I don't know why. I Have was you do about a demonstration for a unboxing in front of all of your soldiers? <laughs> <laughs> you can sell it. You could be like a, a salesman. And I just use it once. <laughs> <while we're laughs> out here. No. Helix Sleep makes premium mattresses and bedding that are customized to fit your unique needs. Everybody's different, right? Well, Helix has this sleep quiz that'll match you with the perfect mattress. And it was perfect for us because we could take the quiz as a couple. You know, Alistair is more of a side sleeper. I'm an all-over sleeper. Alistair likes a firm mattress. I like my mattress medium. We took the quiz and we were matched with the Midnight Mattress. Now, one great part to all this is that Helix will ship your mattress right to your door for free in the US. It comes rolled up in a box and is super easy to set up and we've done it twice. And if it makes you nervous to buy something that you haven't tried, well, Helix has a 100 night sleep trial so you get more than three months to make sure that you absolutely love it. Well, if you or somebody you know is in the market for a new mattress and you think that Helix sounds right for you, you can go to helixsleep.com slash tequila where you can get 20 20% off of your mattress. Plus two free dream pillows. Ooh. Cheers. Cheers to that, baby. Yeah, she's one of the she's one of the most exploited like Hollywood child actors. Um, you know, her and Drew Barrymore have a lot in common. And they she went on the Drew Barrymore show. She's been on there a couple times, but she went on to promote this documentary. Mm-hmm. And they had a really good conversation on the Drew Barrymore show. I, I highly recommend everybody going and, and checking it out. <laughs> Drew but gets like all on the couch too and like th- takes her shoes off. This is how they were. It's- as close as you can get, right? As close <laughs> yeah. as you can get. But they have a very shared similar experience as far as being child stars and having stage mothers and all of that, right? Um, and Drew was really remarking that Brooks mom terry was like the ideal stage mother that was kind of legendary in hollywood and every stage mother wanted to be like terry right and terry was looked at as like being this protective stage mother and on all of these things but in reality she really wasn't right um so brooke shields is born in like what uh 1965 her mother and her father like met they had this little affair uh the father went away for work and he came back and terry her mother was pregnant like, big pregnant, very visibly, right? And the father was like, okay, well, I guess we get married. They got married. That didn't last long. Eventually, Terry left the father and took her, and they, like, moved, like, from New York to California. And um, she she remarks that with her father, there was always structure, right? Her dad wasn't super into mm-hmm. the Hollywood scene. He didn't care about any of that stuff. Um and he he was the the structure in her life, but with her mother, they were like bouncing all over the place. And we we we've covered the Jeanette McCurdy book, and so we have we've talked about an example of a stage mother before. And this was sort of in that in that same vein, but like different at the same time, right? Like Brooke really remarks that her mother was not a strict stage mother. She was a stage mother, and she was pushing her out on auditions and and modeling gigs and booking her all of these jobs, right? And like. She was the breadwinner, yeah. but her mother was also like pretty lax in that if she didn't want to work that day, her mom would be like, okay, well, let's go get ice cream and go to the movies or something like that, right? Like she wasn't Jeanette McCurdy's mom forcing her onto this Nickelodeon set, even though she didn't want to be there. I mean, it, it, it was definitely a best friend kind of relationship, which I I, I think we've all yeah. seen uh, a, a lot of times where um, mothers uh, put a lot more of their emotional time and energy into other kids when they don't obviously have... 
a partner to do well, that somebody, with. Well, and I think that Terry made Brooke her whole world, right? I think Brooke even said that in an interview at one point where it's that um, somebody asked her, why do you think you, um, your mother like never found another another man, like, never pursued other relationships? And she was Brooke was like, yeah, she was in love with me. I mm-hmm. was her whole world. I was at the center of her focus. Um, she never had a focus outside of me. And that's very, very true. And so her and her mother developed this really, really codependent relationship. Um, and her mother is really just using her for so like with with a lot of stage moms you get uh, the mother sort of living vicariously through their daughter or their son or whoever they're putting out there right um and and you know they're booking them all of these jobs in a way getting to live that themselves with terry it doesn't feel like that with terry you know there's a book where that brooke wrote a couple years ago about her and her mother's relationship and i think that probably goes into the relationship a lot more than is depicted in the documentary and so Mm -hmm. i really want to read that but from what we got from the documentary um her mother really wasn't the stage mom who was living vicariously through brooke she was just using brooke to get the income to get themselves a place to live keep a roof over their head get food on the table and then so that she could go out and like just drink because her mother was a big alcoholic and brooke talks about this all through the documentaries that her mom was real bad alcoholic and i think she was getting you know it was, it was a way for her to, quote unquote, be lazy and not have to go out and get a job herself. Her daughter had the job and she could go and fuck off and do whatever she wanted, you know? I, I wouldn't even say lazy because I, I don't know how much work she put into being a momager. Mm-hmm. But um, I do think that um, we, 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 we could say that she definitely used Brooke Shields as a safety net. Yes. She said, I have a pretty kid. I'm going to, uh, I don't want to use the words exploit. But well, she obviously wasn't going to think of it monetize as that. Yeah, she wasn't thinking of it that way. Um, she wasn't thinking of it as exploiting, even though that's exactly what it was, right? Um, she has said that Brooke was going to be a star since she was a baby. Mm-hmm. She knew she was going to be a star since she was a baby. And you look at pictures of baby Brooke Shields, and that again, like that is a baby that you think I'm going to put that in on a Gerber ad or on a Gerber ad or something yeah. like that. Yes, very much so. And so she like immediately recognized that, and and. Brooke, her dad's genes are strong because she looks exactly like her dad, right? She makes a joke later in this documentary where she's like, um, "Your, uh, your, um, my dad." You know, everybody asks him, "Oh, you look just like Brooke Shields." <laughs> 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 so there's a lot in this documentary about um, her looks and her appearance and her her persona and and all of that, right? That's very integral into the Brooke Shield story. Um, as much as she probably wishes it, w- it weren't, right? But it is. And so by the time when she's born in 1965, the ideal, like, image is Marilyn Monroe, right? Like, it's the, it's the bombshell, woman. voluptuous, yeah. blonde, you know, that bombshell look, right? And so when Brooke Shields is born, um, and when she starts coming up, like, as a child star, um, she has a very distinctive, striking look, right? That is very different from... Marilyn, yeah. the Marilyn Monroe image, and she almost started this new sort of image. Yeah, you know, it, it, it was mostly in her face because everybody talked about how striking her face was. Yeah, and they were also talking about a, a little bit in the documentary about new wave fem- feminism, mm-hmm. um, which pushed, I guess, uh, Hollywood to sexualize uh, young girls instead of women. Uh, did they make that connection? I don't yeah, they did make that guy. connection in there. Mm-hmm. They do remark in this that she re- represented a femininity of that time, right? Um, and when you look at her, it's not even a femininity that you would... Just like not a classic femininity, right? She has very masculine features. She has very yeah. thick eyebrows, right? And she's six foot tall. Because yeah. she looked tall in that documentary. And I was like, well, how t- freaking tall is she? And I, I looked thought, it up. She I, is six foot tall. It, it looked to me that she was like five, like five and then like suddenly she was like six foot two yeah <laughs> like it was like what i think when i saw her next to who do who do we see her next to she was standing next to somebody in like that a documentary and it might yeah. have been drew barrymore honestly um she was standing next to somebody and i could tell she was tall and i was like damn six foot six well, she's foot. model tall yeah would you ever be a dadager would i ever be a dadager um see i wish i'd had a momager <laughs> yeah but I don't think I would be a dadager. I think there's a way to do that without it being exploitative. I don't think I would need to go and push my kid out on... And obviously, first and foremost, they would have to express that this is what they want to do, right? Mm -hmm. But I do think when your kid expresses to you that they want to do something, 
um, to a certain extent, you you nourish that, right? And so I think the w- perfect way to nourish it is put your kid in plays, put your kid in like you know um, drama school and things like that, right? Like like let them nurture that, and then when they get a little bit older and are able to understand more and understand agency more, which is a big theme in this documentary. Um, they can make those decisions to go out and do like bigger work and try to go big time with those things. What about you? Would you? <laughs> I don't know uh, because I, I think it's a it's a question of like, hey, are they asking for it or yeah. are you pushing them to it? And if they ask for it, if they hey, they say, hey, can I go to, to to some acting classes? And then somebody comes up to you and says, hey, I would love to cast your child mm-hmm. in this new show or uh, commercial. Are you going to say no at that point? Yeah. Or is that just going to be like, okay, I feel like I'm being moral about the way I'm going around this and then I'm going to say yes. And the yeah. sexualization of children is like on the rise at this point and it really is perfectly exemplified with Brooke Shields. A lot of her photo shoots are very risque. A lot of these um, different things that she's doing is just she's she's being looked at as pretty baby. That's before even she even reaches the mo- movie pretty baby. She's looked at as pretty baby. Um, and they're putting like makeup on her and it was definitely trying to make it, it was a young girl in an adult world mm-hmm. with adult themes. It's, yes. You know, uh, and then Terry Shields said to Barbara Walters. Yeah, that was this wild. shocked me. That was wild. He said, ever since Brooke has been a baby, she has been encouraged to be sensual. And I was like. Did you just say that out loud? And it's easy to like kind of narrow that down to to alcohol because she was an alcoholic, but I don't even know how deep in alcohol she was at this point. Like that was a conscious thing that she was doing, you know, regularly putting her daughter in these types yeah. of photo shoots and all of these things. Well, the- and Brooke talks about it and she says, you know, I was I was doing sort of these things with more adult under, over overtones, undertones, themes, all of that, right? But like I hadn't even gone through puberty yet. I didn't really understand the things that I was doing. I didn't like that. Didn't really register with me. Well, and every, everything was very gray because her mother was a big movie fanatic, mm-hmm. um, and would bring her. She said sometimes it'd be three movies a night, and they'd go to just normal movies, and then they'd go to like uh, French or foreign films uh, where things are a lot more gray than they are for American films mm-hmm. um, in terms of of what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. And so she didn't have a line for what was appropriate and what wasn't appropriate. Yeah, she. I mean, and that's the thing with like a mother who's treating you more like a friend than than she is a mother. Um, I really want a, a Drew Barrymore documentary too, because listening to the, them two talk, talk about it, it feels like we need the documentary for Drew Barrymore too. Drew Barrymore also does have like two memoirs that she's written as well, so we ought to cover those at some point. But um, Drew Barrymore's mother was the exact same way, right? Like she treated her daughter as a friend, and. You know, her daughter was a way for her to get into like social circles and go out drinking and like get into oh, yes. all of the glamour and all of that. She, she was saying how her her mother would date her boyfriends. Yeah, whole separate issue. Whole oh separate my gosh, issue. I was like, that what? Was, was <laughs> but, well, Brooke Shields. Uh, <laughs> no, but that was in in her interview with Brooke Shields. That was. So. It was. It was. <laughs> like, um, so, like, um, obviously the push is for Brooke Shields to be this big star, right? And you have these – child, like, the, there's a lot of archival footage in this documentary, um, and all of these interviews that Brooke Shields is doing is – her mother is right there next to her, right? Almost holding her hand while she's doing the interview. Um, and in, on, you know, on first glance, you would look at that and you would be like, oh, well, she's protecting her. She's there next to her, right? Mm-hmm. Really, she's there to, like, f- almost field um, – uh, Questions that question herself rather than, you know, some old perverted man asking her daughter about being sensual at 10 years and old. And her, like, right? stopping that? Yeah, she doesn't stop that. But if you ask her about herself, she's going to be there to defend herself and her her decision putting her daughter in these these different situations. Well, it's crazy because she almost puts herself on, uh, like, up there to be judged as a mother, I feel like, when she, she, she actually joins the interviews. Yeah. You know, you can say, hey, this is a person allowing this to happen. That happens a lot, though. I notice a lot of Britney Spears similarities, and I'm a big Britney Spears fan, so we're going to get a lot of Britney Spears mentions in this. Um, Britney's mom, initially, when Britney was going on interviews and stuff like that, a lot of times Britney's mom was in those interviews, too, you know. Um, so that was really interesting to me, yeah, seeing that sort of parallel, um, because Britney was also a young star that was hypersexualized as a child and had these like adult men asking her about her breasts when she was 17 years old. Right. And virginity. Yes. And Brooke was even younger, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so it's just, it's, it's wild. Uh, but like the, the push is for Brooke to be a star. And so she gets this movie, pretty baby. And this is like her big star making movie. This is what really like hits her in the big time 
Um, and it's a movie about child prostitution. Like she gets sold as a child prostitute and it's based on a true story, um, which is, it was like in the early 1900s. Yeah. In, in, in the Storyville red lot district, it was a, a true yeah. story. And so, um, but Brooke is like in this, so true stories need to be told. And like that girl's story should be told, right? But it's like, I guess the question is like, how do you tell it? Because if you make a movie about it and you have to cast this young actress, this actress doesn't know what she's doing. This actress, a young actress that is like 9, 10, 11, 12, doesn't understand the themes that are going on in, in this story, right? But that also does parallel as like the real little girl probably didn't understand entirely what was going on. But still, you don't want to make a 12-year-old Brooke Shields go in and act these things out. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm very, I, I was uncomfortable with them even describing the movie mm -hmm. and then her like talking through the movie and she was even given interviews. You know, I think it's going to be very artsy and appropriate. That was you could wild tell that, to me. That was you, coaching. You could tell that yes. she was told that, yeah. um, it, it, that everybody was going to be respectful on set. And, um, she said that her opposite co-star was respectful to, to her. Well, she even maintains that as an adult is like she was like, because there's this man who has to kiss her, like a fully grown man kissing this 12 year old, right? And you can say, oh, it's just a movie. But no, like that, that's a grown man kissing this child. And even him saying it's make believe she or has it's to, still, yeah. she has to deal with that and, and remember that the rest of her life, right? That her first kiss was with this older man and he did tell her she's like she she praises him for telling her um during it she was like you know this doesn't count right um this isn't your first kiss this doesn't count you you know this is make-believe this is acting yeah um and she really gives him credit for that and so i mean a good i guess she gives a lot of grace in this documentary is what i noticed she does and i think that's okay because uh yeah. because that's her experience and uh, i mean we, we we've covered several um, uh, celebrities or s several people who give grace to people who could be viewed as their abusers because if, for them it is very gray. Yeah. Well, that's what Drew and, and um, Brooke were talking about on Drew's show is that Drew is like, you know, when the whole Me Too movement came out, I didn't speak out a whole bunch because I was still trying to, like, I wasn't sure everything that had happened to me or that had I, I'd been through, um, I wasn't sure what I had a part in, what was kind of my fault, what was somebody else doing to me, like everything felt, looked so gray and I really wasn't able to differentiate it. And what I noticed about Brooke throughout this entire documentary is I think she's still there too. I think she is in that same exact spot where everything that happened in her life was so gray that she really can't, it almost feels like she can't differentiate like what was uh, like obviously on surface level she knows that like yeah th she shouldn't have been put in like these risque photo shoots she shouldn't have been put in these risque movies like she shouldn't be in fucking playboy mm -hmm. at that young of an age right but um it's it also almost, something that happened it almost so. feels like it's ever all of it looks so gray that she doesn't even really know how to like she can say how she felt about it at the time but she doesn't know which parts to because I would say, well, that grown man shouldn't have been kissing me right but if I were in the situation I might say. But he was really great about it because he he really assured me that this doesn't count. This and isn't your first time. You almost right? feel a need to defend other people's actions. I wonder if because there's a you were bit of a participant in, in the actions. Yeah, I, as well. I wonder. And she gives her mother a lot of. That's why I really want to read the book and to see if she goes harder on her mother because her she gives her mother a lot of grace. Um, so there's even a part where she's like, you know, I do sympathize with my mother. She grew up. She had a really rough upbringing too, you know, and she was kind of doing the best she could. And she does criticize her mother. She's like, she was an alcoholic. She wouldn't get help. She wouldn't do all this stuff. Um, but she more so goes harder on the men which absolutely deserved the mm -hmm. men who who were parts of these situations than she did on her mother who also put her in those situations which i thought was really really interesting well what was interesting is uh they made a comment about how uh people not just her would uh would uh criticize her mother more mm -hmm. so than any of the male directors who were like making the movies happening? Yeah, uh, it happened uh, the, 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 for the male directors. That was art, so it's excusable. Mm -hmm. But for the mother, um, it's inexcusable. Which I understand because for a lot of, for m kids, their parents are their first line of defense. Yeah, um, but at the same time, if 
you're employing a child actor, you have a responsibility. So I'm pretty baby. She she does talk about how her mother wasn't always there on set, which is wild to me. A movie with this subject matter, and you wouldn't be there the entire time your daughter was working. She would like come in and out of set, right? She would also like she was protective, but again, she was protective in a way that was more skewed. Like she wasn't protective about the material and her daughter kissing this older man and her daughter having to do these these different things in this movie, um, her 12-year-old daughter, she was more protective about, oh, Brooke's working 14 hours. That's too much, right? Which, again, you should... Well, yeah, you should well, that's good, well, but well, also, She was like, she's working 14 hours. She's not getting time to study. And she was like, I, I want to make sure that my kid has these pillars. Yeah. It just didn't seem like her mother put a lot of... uh, Not credit, but like... It didn't seem like her mother really cared about sexuality like i don't that. think she i don't i don't think that was just a huge uh, uh thought process for her i don't yeah. think she really saw it as this like big problem i think she was like well my daughter's not like having sex with these men right this is yeah. make-believe this is acting there's nothing wrong with that um i think that's very much where her mother's mindset was um so she the the, the movie becomes a real subject of like while it was like critically kind of praised the, the movie was really became a subject of child pornography discussions and child exploitation well, people were calling it kitty porn yes yes um and people were talking about the ethics of it, and but still, you know, you you have this whole conversation starting up about it, and it's wild that it took to like 1977 for people to have conversations about these things, right? When little Shirley Temple was off doing, you know, all the all those like it was so weird, those put being put, and also those six situations. Um, but she, so like all of these conversations are still happening, but she is still allowed to pose nude for a photographer in his book. When she is ten years old, nine or ten years old, that was so weird to me. I I, I feel like that's in, inexcusable, inexcusable. Yeah, and that is the only fault that goes there. Or like, the photographer obviously shouldn't be doing it, and he like gets a fair share of the blame. But her mother was her first line of defense to keep her from ever having to have done something like that. Yes, and she her and she did this before Pretty Baby. So before Pretty Baby, her mother has her photographed nude and, and, completely and, and, it's, and nude. it's not just like nude, just like there it it's is new posing in posing and, and the posing is like really sensual. She's wearing makeup. She has her hair all done. It's like, like real sick shit. Um, so, uh, she becomes this teen sensation, right? Like pretty baby really blasts her into, into stardom. And she becomes this teen sensation. She does blue lagoon, which is a really big movie for her. Um, she talks a lot about Blue Lagoon in this because Blue Lagoon is like arguably one of her, her most recognizable role, you know? Yeah, a lot of people said Pretty Baby. I've, I've never heard Pretty Baby before, but I definitely heard of Blue Lagoon. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I've already talked about it. It's all in my notes. I've already talked about like being jealous and like wanting to have been in that movie. And yeah. <laughs> um, but she's talking about it and she's like, you know, she's she really is naked in that movie. You know, she's like 15 years old, 14, 15 years old when she does that movie. I actually forgot how nude they were until they started playing the clips from it. I don't even it. know if on TV they like, showed her nude. I don't remember, but I don't remember. Well, I didn't remember. They, they used to nude. play it, rerun it on TV mm -hmm. too. And I'm wondering, because I, I looked up to see if we can stream it and it's available on HBO. Speaking of streaming services, uh, and I, I'm wondering if there's a uh, censored version and an uncensored version. Mm -hmm. Well, she is, so she keeps being like at this point her image as as this little woman child I think is what they called it at one point a sexy woman child is really being pushed right and so like her young her her modeling shoots her younger roles Blue Lagoon it's all like Brooke Shields the sexy woman child you know personally she hasn't even gotten in touch with her sexuality yet and her sexual identity and like been able to explore that right like that has kind of been explored for her and she's been forced to kind of do some like surface level exploring of that or or, or simulating that it, stuff i mean it's and, acting right yeah, so yeah. Uh, so especially if you're not having those feelings it's it's acting at that mm -hmm. point and you're not understanding what they're saying but um it, it it was she said something about like the director really wanted her it was almost a reality show for that movie where yeah. they were trying to have the two young actors explore their sexuality throughout the movie 
and us kind of like witness that. Well, and for like teens and for younger folks who watch it, it really is like fantasy. It's such a fant- the fantastical movie, right? Yeah, these these two island. young people on an island, you know, and they fall in love, and it's like you know, it's it's got that fantasy element that we that kind of like entices us. It was us. always a little icky because they grew up together. But then you and think about like, it as adults, and you go back and you watch it as an adult, and it's it's it really is like not okay yeah it's <laughs> like uh, yeah. if you're going to do a movie like that cast your old cast people who are 18 yeah you know 18 19 years old um brooke shields is 15 going nude in this movie it's wild but then like i thought the the movie she does uh, a little bit after this was absolutely insane it was, what was it called endless love where she has to it's all about this teenager like exploring her sexuality and um Oh, yes. Losing her virginity. So it's like the illusion of destroying virginity over and over again, which yes. is honestly a theme with all of her early, early movies. Mm-hmm. It was it was them being like, innocent girl, losing her virginity. In- yes. Innocent girl, and losing so her she virginity. she has to simulate losing her virginity, and she talks about how the director is like below frame, like pulling her toe because he wants her to... Because she Twisting doesn't, it, it she doesn't have that experience, right? She hasn't like lost her virginity. She hasn't had sex with anybody. It's not really like in the forefront of her mind. Um she starts looking at acting roles as being like transactional, right? She shows up, she does the work, she gets the money, she leaves, and it's not really as fulfilling. Um, and so she's doing this movie, and this guy's like, this director's like pulling her toe and twisting her toe to get her to make faces, like O faces, you know? And it's just not something. And, and she just like, this is the point where she talks about having to dissociate, and she kind of has to like leave her body, you know, right? Where she like just checks out for a little bit while it gets done, and. Then she comes back into herself and she's able to like carry on with the work, right? Like a big, a big theme with her and in this documentary is that she kind of learns to, with different situations, just learns to kind of go blank, shut it off, don't really think about it, and you continue on, right? Things happen, you just continue on, you just keep going. I mean, it, 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 uh, oftentimes with children, when they, re- you know, have a lot of trauma, mm-hmm. they learn to do that. Well, she's not able to like, She's not able to go to anybody and say, hey, this is making me uncomfortable. She says that's making me uncomfortable. They're going to be like, oh, this difficult child actor, you know, like, Terry, get your daughter in line. That's what they're going to say. Um, she does a Calvin Klein, or Calvin Klein jeans ad, which was too sexy because of her posing. Too sexy for her jeans. Um, it was it was. So the ad itself, like the photos, um, I only saw a couple of them. I'd, yeah. need, I'd need to see all of them. I saw the billboard like, photos. Yeah, a couple of them are fun. I, yeah. I do think like the the shirt open and showing her midriff, um, I think that right there you could be like, eh, either way about. But I didn't think the posing was all that provocative. It was the, the video, video and the commercial, yeah. and they're having her like writhe around in these jeans and like put jeans on on camera. And like, you know, she's, you know, it's just this weird, like voyeuristic, um, just this icky sort of feeling thing where she almost feels like too innocent to understand that these older men are going to be watching her but it, put but, on these jeans and whatever's going to race through their mind, right? But the thing is, it isn't older men watching her. It's teenagers. That's all and they're their jeans. wanting to be her. Listen, and Brooke Shields was, uh, like, just, just all of the uh, all of that aside, like, Brooke Shields was gorgeous. She had dolls. She had, she had, she was the, the, the epitome of a teen at that point. Everybody wanted to be Brooke Shields, you know? Yeah. She had a place, like, a massive stamp in uh, the pop culture, like she was the American teenage girl. The time. Yeah, absolutely. So these nude photos she took when she was like nine, ten years old, right? Um, that her mother again fully put her in and allowed this man to take these nude photos of her. Um, they resurfaced because this photographer is like, "Oh, Brooke Shields, big star now, right? I'm going to sell these photos." Originally, it had just been for like a photography book. And apparently this had been a family friend too. So yeah, which is a really weird family friend to have. It was. It was. It was. And so, like, he, they, like, went to court over this because uh, Terry and Brooke, and I'm, I'm guessing Brooke's whole team, was, like, really trying to keep these photos from, from being circulated, right? They were already out in a book, but, like, to keep these figure, post uh, these photos from being circulated. I don't know how, how that ever got to a fucking court of law, no, right? It, it, That's cr- child crazy. pornography. Are we really questioning if child pornography should have been circulated at that time? So, and, and, and you can see the court transcripts too. And it, it's crazy the, the stuff they ask her, mm-hmm. you know, do you want to be sexual? Do you want to be seen like this? Uh, do you want this? And it was really just putting her on trial for, you know, uh, being a, a teenage girl 
who unfortunately had this circumstance happen to her. You know, she had no consent. She didn't make the decision. To she had no consent over that. Man. And, and now she's trying to have some agency and get these photos not out there. And they lose the fucking case. Well, they lose the case, and the photographer has the right to go and like shop these photos around. Shops up to Playboy. Playboy publishes these fucking photos. Sick as shit. That's disgusting. Sick as shit. That is disgusting. It's disgusting. And you know what was even crazier though is like that she, her while well, she was on trial, she, her image was put on trial, right? So they were trying to like it was basically a trial of deciding whether Brooke Shields deserved respect because of how her image had been up to that point, right? Her re- image had been risque. So why do you deserve respect at Brooke Shields? You're making, your, you're making yourself at 12 years old look risque by doing pretty baby, you know? It's not all these adults who are, like, putting yeah. you in these situations. Fucking ridiculous. But, like, she doesn't really go after her mother at that time. We don't hear her say anything about her mother having her do those photos. No, uh, we, don't, we don't hear that. But mm. I think that the relationship severely changes... Not it necessarily does, after this, but like they're still very codependent at this time, yes. right? Um, and so they are just like side by side all the time. And her, she's really trying to get her mother help because her mother's a big alcoholic, and so she tells these stories where like her mom would go out and she would bring friends home, and like then her mom would come home like a day later or like hours later, and she when what she would hear her mom come home, she would have almost this like drill that she knew what to do, right? She would take a friend and they would go into the bedroom. They would lock certain doors so that her mom wouldn't get in. They would like hear her mom like kind of going out there. And when they didn't hear anything anymore, they knew her mom had probably passed out and she would go out and like take care of her mom. Right. And what was a little wild was that she said, well, I did have, I felt like I had to take care of her mom. So she was the take- caretaker for herself and, for, and her for her mother. And because she, and she had to take care of her mother, not only because she loved her and she was codependent, right? But because this was what struck me was that because her whole being and career and livelihood and everything that she was, that Brooke Shields was, she thought relied on her mother. And if her mother like passed out and died and like choked on her own vomit, then no more Brooke Shields, right? Is almost how she felt. No, no, that's very true. But she also had some influence from her father. Um, Did she? Well, she said that that's one of the reasons why she decided to go to Princeton. Yes. So her father wasn't like, that's another thing is like her father seems like the better of the two parents but yeah. again still didn't keep her from doing all of these things that yeah, they said that he just ignored her doing all he of just that. ignored it all he just ignored it all and kind of like kept hollywood out of their life when he would come when she would come visit him but he did encourage her to go to college and even her mother encouraged her to go to college mm-hmm. she goes to princeton university yeah princeton i was I like the university I, of alabama okay um and her mother even says that like she gets really she goes to college she gets really homesick i really like identified with this she gets really homesick um and like wants to go home all the time and she's, she's calling just, her mom three to even, five times a day yeah, and she's thinking about leaving college and just going back with her mom and her mom tells her you know as much as i love you and i'd love to have you here you will regret this if you leave you cannot leave which is true because i uh, I was almost thinking, because then again, I don't know a lot about Brooke Shields. So I, I was thinking she was going to leave college. I, I think, thought so, too. I thought she was going to drop out. I was out. discovering everything. I was, I was like, is she going to finish college? This is a whole TV show for me. No, but for, for me, it was a revelation, her talking about her college experience and her being there. And she, she, she was like, you would think that everybody would be crowding around me, talking, you know, asking all these questions. But really, people wanted to leave me alone. They wanted to give me my space. But she was like, I didn't want space. I wanted friends. She, she said in Hollywood, <laughs> people were pawing at me all the time. No, I was never left alone, right? And then yeah. I'm in college and I'm left alone all the time. And it was really upsetting for me. And, she's, and she, yeah, even she just I, friends. I'm not a celebrity, but I like even understood that when I went to college, right? Like it was lonely. When you first go to college and you don't know, you don't know people, you're trying to like sort of carve out your own sort of adult space. You're like an adult technically, but you don't yeah. feel like an adult and you feel like you shouldn't be on your, and it gets really lonely and you just like, miss home so bad so i totally understood the homesickness is, is hard the first time you go to college yeah or really th- that you permanently leave your home so the media starts making jokes about it though it's like they make jokes about brook shields and and going to college and i guess what one like talk show host made a joke about um she's getting good grades in her classes she gets an a in anatomy her anatomy it was such a inhale. It was such a bad joke. Yeah, no, is is terrible. And again, like this image that had been crafted for her that she didn't put out there. You know, adults were putting that image out there for oh, her, yeah. but it stuck with her. Well, well then it was like a because it, it was contrary to everybody's 
image of her, right? Mm -hmm. It was uh, it was because a sex symbol doesn't go to Princeton. The, the thing is, is everybody didn't want to talk about her going to Princeton University. They wanted yeah. to talk about her virginity. Yes. So that that comes from this book, right? Is um, she does a book while she's in college called "On My Own," all about like Brooke Shields oh, and being on her own, and you know she's an adult now and like learning lessons, and it's all it's like this puff piece, right? She wanted to write this real serious book, and they didn't really want her to do that, and they came up with this puff piece. But there's a section in there about virginity and her. It's like half a page, and her <laughs> still having her virginity, and everybody honed in on that. That is the exact thing that everybody honed in on, right? Because. She is this, it, it, it's it's this public's fascination and entitlement to this young girl's coming of age. Mm -hmm. All aspects of her coming of age, her virginity, her sexuality, all of that, right? Her image, um, all of these different things. And so that is the part that people like really hone in on in this book. And she becomes this like spokesperson for... Some sort of like moral high ground, holding on to your virginity abstinence. and abstinence and all of these well, different well, be, things. Because she said she wanted to wait until she found somebody she fell in love with, uh, you know, to lose her virginity. And it was just such a big thing because I was like, either you're a prude or you're a slut, you can... Or uh, you can't be both. You can't be somebody, somebody who's both in innocent yeah. and, and somebody who also has a, a sexual life. And it, 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 But that's definitely not true. Well, she... It's all about consent. She, yeah, an agency, right? Like agency, I think agency over her own image was something that was really important to her, but she had no idea. Like she went through a lot of her career without thinking that she ever needed her own agency, right? And so the agency is like taken, it's, it's taken from her without her even knowing, and she's being touted as this pretty baby, and now all of a sudden this poster child for abstinence, right? Like other people are controlling her narrative, and it's not like... Oh, this 18, 19, 20 year old girl who is just kind of doing what we all do when we reach those ages and discovering herself and like not just her sexuality, but who she is as a damn person, you know, and we all get the opportunity to do that. And it doesn't look like she was given that opportunity. She was being told who she was. And so she was trying to like reconcile that with how she felt personally, right? Well, she probably got that more from being in college. Stuff did get better for her. She joined drama clubs, uh, the Triangle Club, and she had friends, and she did plays, and she got a serious b boyfriend, mm -hmm. Dean Kane. And I told you I recognized him. I just looked him up right now. He he was Superman. Is that the one she uh, lost her virginity the, to? Yeah, yeah. Her first, okay. her first serious boyfriend were like... Uh, you know, they figured stuff out by themselves. Well, she told she, she that's a really important story to her, right? Because she is again had has this identity projected onto her, and so when she does finally lose her virginity, and she's like fully aware of all of the discussions going on around her virginity, and so it also it almost builds the, up this expectation for herself and for whoever her partner is, right? And she's like thinking of of him and like what his expectations of lose of having sex with Brooke Shields is going to be like, right? And so she gets really embarrassed and really upset. And after it's done, like she like runs off and she's, you know, humiliated and he like goes after her and he's like, no, like, it's okay. I'm like, you're okay. going to change. Exactly. You're the same person that I, I met. This is, you know, why we're in a relationship. I like you, you know, you're, it's so, it's so crazy that we put such a premium on virginity. Cause it's like nothing really changes. Well, m m female I mean, virginity. Well, it's yeah. female virginity, right? Because like you don't see – like everybody's always talked about like Leonardo DiCaprio, right, was a child star. And they talked about him being a heartthrob and what girlfriends he had. And so then that way it's very similar to you know, what girls go through and they want to know all about the boyfriends, like Taylor Swift's boyfriends, Britney Spears' boyfriends, Brooke Shields' boyfriends. Um, but, you know – people didn't hound Leo about his virginity. They didn't hound Leo about um, – when he's going to get married and stuff like that. It wasn't until Leo like turned 40 that people were like, Leo, when are you getting married? <laughs> what is going on right what now? What is going on here? You got to get His married. His 25th, 25 year old girlfriend. <laughs> exactly. And now people talk about it, but like it took him to like 40 years old for people to talk about it. Where yeah. as like with girls, it's the younger they are, the more honed in and in, in, in on a microscope they are. Right. Um, well, because they don't take them seriously professionally, even as 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 actors back then, you know, acting isn't necessarily your like main thing. And mm -hmm. she even said like uh, an educated woman isn't like something that Hollywood wants. Well, and people were like really like going in on like they, they wanted to again, they wanted to know her entire coming of age. Right. And so like they're honing in on anytime she goes on a date, she went on a date with uh, JFK Jr. And 
That was a handsome man, by the way. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, you showed me pictures of that. A very handsome man. Um, JFK Jr., she goes, th- there's rumors that she's dating Michael Jackson. and he Which he even, perpetuates. He confirms it in an Oprah interview, and she's like, I wasn't, I never dated Michael Jackson. I was dating somebody else at the time. And he just, like, other people were using her, her image, right? Um God, if, I hope she never listens to this because she would hate this recording. Probably. She, she's like very much like, um, I'm not a victim, I'm not a victim, I'm not a victim, right? Well, I mean, no, but she can she can say that. Though. She can say that, yes. She, she, she says, I am not going to be a victim. And I think that's completely fair. Oh, for completely her valid. I don't need her in this, in this documentary. She has shared enough in this documentary. I don't need her to completely trauma dump and like cry and bawl and like say these people did this to me yeah she however she wanted to handle it is is, is the correct way and it's the valid way and I, well and, and she talks about this being a documentary not just for her but for a lot of other young actors in hollywood mm-hmm. and and her experience mir- mirrors some of their experiences yeah um she does leave so she because she's like out of call or she's in college for like four years and she is out of she doesn't really do any work, right? Like in Hollywood, she kind of like takes a little bit of a break. And by the time she comes back, her star has faded a little bit. Like yeah. people, she's not getting as many roles and she's kind of struggling to get her career going again. And she kind of expected it to like, you go back to Hollywood, you get a movie and you know, instead she's doing commercials and which, like which taking is on sponsors. And interesting because she came to college when she was on top and for her, it was just stepping out of college and her still being on mm-hmm. top. But that's not the case. One, um, she's older, and for some reason, they were obsessed with her being super young and super obsessed innocent, with her youth, you yeah. know. And, and and she's had boyfriends now, so they're not obsessed with her virginity anymore. And then she put out a movie that flopped. Well, so that's a really interesting point too that I was going to talk about a little bit later. Is that by the time she becomes a full grown like woman, you know, like she's a fully grown woman with an adult woman relationship and an adult woman like adult woman business um nobody gives a fuck anymore it's not her coming because because we've already played out her coming of age and that was the most sensual part of her life and her as an adult woman in an adult relationship is not interesting anymore and so Mm -hmm. people are like "Mm, don't care you know don't really care about that and that to me was like i was like wow I, it, you know? it, 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 it it was pretty crazy to me. I mean, she she still I, I guess was the the woman of the eighties. What did, what did t- time call her? Sort of like the uh, the like image that. of the eighties. Um, she um she does get she like so she gets out of college and she meets this guy um, Andre, who she ends up getting married to, and he is that becomes another really codependent relationship for her, right? And she almost looks at it as like, well, I didn't really know it then, or at least subconsciously I knew it, but. I needed another codependent relationship to get out of my codependent relationship with my mother, right? It's because my mother was an alcoholic. She wasn't like good. She wasn't good for the business of Brook Shields. She wasn't really involved in the business of Brook Shields anymore. She wasn't like I needed her to step back, but she wouldn't do it. And so I got into this other codependent relationship almost to get me to get out of this one with my mother. And so um, her her man Andre is a tennis player. He was, uh, he, he was like top of the tennis players. I get I don't know no no shit about tennis. Okay, okay. Uh, he was he was up there with the the Serena's the ten, the tennis. Yeah. The tennis. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was up there. He, up there. We know, we know Andre. He was hitting If you don't them. know Andre, you was, just got to get into the tennis. Yeah. Uh, but, but she like, so like she, they have this office building that's like an archive full of all of Brooke Shields' stuff, right? And so she and Andre go in and like take all of that stuff. And don't tell her mother about it. The next time her mother goes into the office, she goes into this empty office. I and everything so is just gone. And I feel bad. And I have that sympathy. Yeah. But at the same time... You know, well, it's, it, well, because it wasn't just all of Brooke Shields stuff. It was also her mother stuff. They just took everything. Yeah. You know, th- they took everything. Um, and it is like, I do have the sympathy for it. I do have the sympathy. She, she for honestly it. could have sued. I guess. But like, she, she goes on a press tour and she's like, my daughter is. I don't like the new is, management. There's, there's too many people in my daughter's life who are not good to her. They're not doing well by her. And Andre really is like almost controlling her just like her mother did, right? Like, Andre takes control of all of the things. Andre is like, hey, we're going to get you your career back. You want your career back? We're going to put you in this. We're going to put you in this. She starts doing Broadway. She starts doing, like, different shows. She has this, like, guest spot on Friends, and during this guest spot on Friends, she makes Andre... Andre, or Andre gets really mad that she, like, puts... I don't know. I don't, I don't, so so it, she's t- talking to... 
which which of the friends was it that she put his finger in? So that was Joey. Joey, and and, and she's talking to him. she's 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 basically the crazy ex girlfriend or, or I don't know she's playing girlfriend. like this this crazy girlfriend and she is funny and this is the first time she's wanted to play comedy for a while but part of it is her being obsessed with Joey crazy obsessed and she puts his fingers into her mouth and is like I just want to eat your fingers but not really yeah Andre just gets like so angry over this moment and goes and destroys all of his own awards and and it's just it's really volatile relationship right they don't really talk about it they kind of sweep it under the rug but she knows that like over like the next little bit that they're together still that, that it's it's going down and so they eventually get a divorce right um and she's and she doesn't really talk bad about any of her past relationships she she, well, she, she talks like, very matter of fact about it yeah it's very matter of fact and if there's any feeling in it it's just her own feeling she's not trying to talk about the feelings of others and yeah. i think that was um pretty pretty good way to to approach it um she does have this moment where she she talks about a rape and i think oh, it's yeah. important to Talk about that, where usually when you hear about rape, right, it's the, the, the stereotype of rape is that it's really rough and there's clawing and there's, you know, trying to get away and somebody holding you down. The way it happens for her, as, as she describes it, is she, again, is str- kind of struggling in this in the, in the industry still. And so she hears that this guy wants her for a movie for a role in a movie and so she goes and meets with him and she's really excited about it they don't really talk about the movie at dinner and then she's gonna need to get a cab to go home and he's like okay we'll come up to my room and we'll call you a cab from up there she goes up to the room he disappears into like the bathroom and she's just kind of waiting around and he comes back out and he's naked and he starts really pushing himself on her right and she says no once and she says i should have just been able to say no once and let it be that but then she starts playing this scenario about it. in her head of like, okay, well, if I push back, if I try to get out of this room, I don't want to get hit. I don't want to get beat. I don't want to get like pushed to the ground and like all of these, like, um, I, I don't want to get hurt, you know, physically. I, I don't want to get physically hurt. And so she kind of just like says, um, so I just like, again, dissociated. It happened. I got up, he opened the door. He told me to, he'll see me later and i left and i I called a friend well i I, I was just thinking that um during this um uh as 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 a woman i I feel like it's hard because you have so many women who try to be nice all the time Mm -hmm. and sometimes you know she was her even going up to that room maybe that was her being nice you know, yeah. just this entire time. And sometimes it's okay not to be nice to people. It's okay to say, hey, I'm not going to take this elevator because there's, there's this freaking strange man going up. Um, I, I, I don't know. I, was just I think thinking it was about probably that. a little bit of that, but it was also that she wanted a role, right? She was going to be nice to this guy who was going to give her a role that she was hoping yeah. to get, right? Um, and she didn't know that was going to happen. And again, she was in a protective mode. She was just wanting to protect herself and get out of that room. This is what a lot of rape situations are like just as well right is like you should only have to say no once um it's whenever your consent is breached exactly and the consent was breached for her and she writes this guy a letter and says hey you did this to me um uh, this is how i feel about it i just she just writes them this letter and he basically dismisses it aggressively dismisses it and says you know you that that never happened well who do you think you are like no that's not that's not right um and she like what is she gonna do she's like i yeah. I'm, am i gonna fight this like how do i fight this i can't fight this and she's like okay so i said well i move on i just move along because there's nothing else i can do which is yeah. again a big like thing that she does is she just kind of like accepts that something has happened and and moves on right and like almost doesn't really even process it in the way that she should at the time, right? But like, how's she going to process it? There, nobody's helping her process that. Well, also, and if he, if he's a power player in Hollywood, it's, I mean, she's, uh, all of these she, different she, factors. I, I, there's so many yeah. factors. She could be thinking about her career as well. Um, she does. She goes on to do a little bit more work, though. She goes on a show called Suddenly Susan. I've never heard of the show four before. Seasons. Yeah, but it sounded so fun to me, honestly. And she does like all of this. It's like a sitcom, and so she talks about it, and she's like, "I'm doing this sitcom, and it actually." was the role that I needed because I got to do physical comedy physical comedy and it really like bolstered my confidence and like I felt I felt really in charge of my performance here and my you know what I was doing right and like as time goes on she's a little bit like annoyed that they keep having her do the shtick of like Brooke yeah, Shields falling it, it, down it, and, when the show doesn't grow with the audience mm-hmm. 
it, it just falters and it's it, it, and it sounded like she recognized that but the show showrunners weren't yeah. recognizing or the the studios weren't recognizing that but it was a show she needed to do it was absolutely important for her growth as a person to do that show um, another thing that was really important to do as a person was when she marries Chris yes um, she gets married to Chris he's like a screenwriter he works in Hollywood and that, Chris Henchy yes um, and she's uh 36 she's, when she gets married to him. And she's still married to him. Yeah. And so she kind of gets to like go and like have this mature relationship. This is like one of the first mature relationships she has in her life. And it's really important in her development and growth process because of how mature it is. So this is a part in the documentary where, where I was confused because I, I I looked it up. I looked up Chris Henchy and I was like, she's still married to him. Mm-hmm. And then I was like, when does she, does she have an affair with Tom Cruise? What happens? Because I, I did not know what... We were he, just waiting for Tom Cruise. I was waiting for Tom Cruise the entire time. <laughs> I did not know when he was going to become part of this narrative. I don't think she did, though. I'm trying to think back. No, no, is, I, I no, no, she, no didn't. she didn't. She didn't, but I thought she did because mm. he started talking about all of her postpartum pregnancy well, stuff. Well, so she gets married to Chris, and they really want to have a baby, and they start trying for one. And it's really hard for her to conceive, and she finally does conceive, right? And then she has the baby. She talked about it in the documentary, how she has this baby, and she thought she was going to look into this baby's eyes and see her entire soul and her whole life and like you know fall in love with this baby, and she doesn't. Um, and she doesn't re- understand why she's like feeling so just dis- like. N- disattached from this baby and she doesn't yeah. really want to be around the baby all that often she's having really like intrusive Fring, thoughts fringy about the, violent thoughts not about her doing violence but, but violence being done to the baby yeah and and yeah. and she's just having all of these thoughts and she's like confiding it this is one thing that i really like is that it does seem like she has people to confide in throughout all of these moments like when she goes she through the rape has a support system when she when she is raped um when she is struggling with postpartum. She has people to talk about it. And so she's talking about it to people and they're like, you know what? I think you might have postpartum. Maybe you should go and get that checked. And she does. And she does have postpartum. And it's something that people don't talk about. And that's why I think it was so, because I remember it being all over the news. I remember like Brooke Shields talking about postpartum being a really big story. It's because people weren't talking about that, right? I I feel like people weren't talking about that before then. Well, it's because if you talked about any sort of postpartum, if you talk about anything other than looking at your baby and seeing your whole life in there, then you were a bad mother you know if you had any other dark thoughts about motherhood you were dark mother you were you were a bad mother and dark sided dork sided dork sided <laughs> dork sided <laughs> <Bar girls! laughs> um and she so she but she starts talking about it she gets help for it and then she starts going publicly and talking about this because she still does have um a platform to talk about these things well, I mean, she's also touring for her book, right? Yes. And so she writes this book about it and she's touring a book and talking about it and stuff like that. And fucking Tom Cruise. He goes, I, I was shocked. Little to see man this. syndrome. He, Not, and I told you, he went on a publicity tour for this, right? He, he was supposed to be talking tour. about, he was supposed to be talking about World of the Worlds. And he started talking about oh, Brooke so Shields and Postpartum. Was, was it during World of the Worlds? I, I, I wore the World's poster behind him, so I figured okay. it was World of the Worlds. So it was during, while he yeah. was doing. Because for a second, ass- I, thought, I thought he actually did a publicity tour just for her. The audacity thing. of this man to sit <laughs> on camera and say and say things like, uh, Brooke doesn't know the, the, that's not a real thing. Postpartum is not a real thing. Brooke doesn't know the latest science about all this. Remember, Tom Cruise is also a Scientologist. So he like, this is coming from Scientology speak. Yes. Um, and all the doctors are like, What? Tom like, Cruise, I don't think you're well informed. <laughs> it's like, this, this isn't a good look for you. What, uh, I, I, I don't want to get on this on tangent. multiple shows. It's not just it's not just one show that he like makes a comment about Brooke Shields on. He goes off on like a little spiel on a couple different shows about it. Um, and she has to write this like open letter to him or open like look at this op ed in some magazine yeah, or newspaper or something. What Tom Cruise doesn't know about estrogen. I was like, get it, Brooke Shields. <laughs> don't talk about women's bodies, Tom Cruise, okay? You don't really know about it. And it's interesting, and not to kick him when he's down, but he has not talked to his daughter, Suri, and since Suri and Kate, Katie left. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. They don't have a relationship, so I don't know, Tom Cruise. Maybe, you know, he, maybe he, don't police other he, people. He was talking about women's bodies and policing women's bodies, and we're mm. still doing that in 2023. Oh, of course. and it's, oh. it's, it's I, I, I don't see it stopping for a very, very long time. Um but it's just like, okay, dude, whatever. Um, and he eventually apologizes to her. And it's like, but I feel like it was like a, it, 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 it was like a forced apology. S- s- somebody from his PR company said, hey, you need to apologize for this. <laughs> the king of, Sci- king of Scientology, you have to apologize for this. <laughs> okay. uh, he is like the king of Scientology, dude. I mean, he, he is. is. like He's like the head honcho over there. 
Um, That's crazy that he's kept his A-list status for so long. Yeah. Her mom does get dementia and dies. Like, so her mom and her have had, like, almost a, a strained relationship ever since she kind of, like, ousted her mom from the business of Brooke Shields. Um, but she still, like, maintained a relationship with her mom, and she said that by the time her mom got dementia and died, she had already kind of accepted her mother's death long she'd before She'd already said then, goodbye a little bit. Because she said that the alcoholism was really, had, had deteriorated her mom's brain enough and really did, kind of taken a toll on their relationship that she kind of had to early on almost almost accept that her mother was kind of gone already right and so by the time her mother dies she's already kind of like in a place where she's already accepted it and it must have still been really hard but it was it, it, it i don't know if it was an easier way but it was just something it was just something that was you know it just is what it is um but she, yeah, and then, like, since then, she's done, like, thing. I see her pop up all the time. She's yeah. always on t- talk shows. Castle she's, for Christmas. Castle for Christmas. Number one Netflix show of all time. Never, no, it's, it's, nothing it's a movie. It's a movie. Oh, movie. I, Nobody's I, ever I, talked I, I to that one. I think she put out another um, a holiday movie. I haven't yeah. seen it, though, because I didn't know it. Otherwise, I would have watched it, but I, I was looking at her IMDb, mm-hmm. but... Um, I mean, she's still putting stuff out. It's a really, it was a really interesting documentary. I really want to read the books because I feel like the books go much more into detail and I really want to hear more about her relationship with her mother. I'm like fascinated with people's relationships with their parents. Like that's one of my like hyper fixations. A ranking of your favorite to least favorite momagers. (laughs) Favorite momagers. I, I have to can, think about can you that. even pick your favorite momager? I don't know. Putting your daughter in, in a naked photo shoot is pretty up there. That might go to number one. I don't know. No, so your favorite? Oh, favorite. No, I said no, favorite no. Least, to least favorite. Least favorite. <laughs> Do I have a favorite? I don't know if I have a favorite. I mean, it's, it's hard because you only really hear about the exploitative uh, mothers yeah. who uh, end up in documentaries or uh, memoirs. So, like, Brooke, like, again, I think she sees everything as, and I'm, I'm really not trying to speak for her, it's just, like, what I've observed is, uh, it seems like she sees everything still really gray, and it's kind of hard to talk about that still. Um, and that really, like, there was a, a really good example at the end where, so, like, her, her daughter's, like, grown up and wanted to start modeling, and Brooke is like, no, no, you cannot model. You can't go into that business. Real bad business. Um, but eventually, she's like, oh, you're going to do it anyway, so I should be protective of you, and I should help you and guide you through this, which is really good. Like, that, children of celebrity parents... Um, those, those are, those are the nepo babies to be right because yep. if you, <laughs> cause those parents know more about it and they can like guide them a little bit better um but there's a scene where they're in like a new york apartment i liked the new york apartment too i did but there, there's a scene where she's sitting with her two daughters and her husband and they're all talking they're going around the table talking about um tiktok and like brooks movies are like clips of them are popping like up on tiktok pretty and, baby and yeah blue lagoon and her daughters are immediately like i won't watch blue lagoon i can't watch pretty baby um because of what was done to you and because of those those type of movies would never be made today and what uh, was like mom because you were naked in blue lagoon and yeah. how old were you and she's like 15 yeah and then what she's like well uh, sydney sweeney was like <gasps> oh, goodness well we i heard the camera go off so we might have lost we might have lost video oh, guys but it's okay we're gonna go uh, on audio we're but, but, but but she was like sydney sweeney was like what tw- in her 20s while she was doing euphoria yeah she was doing a teenager stuff. right they and hire an actual teenager yeah so that's different and then the big question was okay well you can say all this and you know i dress the way i dress for the calvin klein stuff but you still have teenagers posting this on instagram or you know dressing like this on tiktok how is that okay and what it comes down to is the girl saying, well, we consented to post that. It was their agency. Yeah, they, they have had agency. an agency. Um, this was like a five-minute conversation. Review it. All you have to do is but. watch this five-minute conversation, and you get the entire gist of the documentary. Yeah. Um, because they talk about all of the themes that are like – and they and it's like she totally didn't plan this. It's like this just kind of happened in the real moment, and you can see it on her face that she's really like thinking – like her reels are really turning while her daughters are talking. Um, and she, so like they talk about agency and how they have their agency when they post on Instagram and it's a little bit scandalous, right? Or risque. That's their agency. They're deciding to do that, right? Mm-hmm. Nobody's making them do that. Nobody's putting them in that situation, right? Um, and also these movies that her mother has done, like those movies would never be made today. And they have a whole conversation about why those movies would never be made today, you know? And she remarks to her daughters that she's so just surprised at how articulate they are 
about all this stuff. And it really is like you see it coming across her face, sort of the comparisons of, of her generation versus this generation, who is this generation is really willing to just immediately call something out, say that's not OK and say we don't stand for that. Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. Whereas her generation, again, she didn't have agency. She didn't have the ability to just say, no, I'm not doing that. Um or even really think about it because she wasn't even able to really think about it, you know, like it was just yeah. kind of happening. And again, that's kind of the kind of woman that she was is something just happened and she kind of just like went with it. And, and she didn't really choose her career at first. You know, she fell into it and she kept on going because she she enjoyed it. But like it wasn't a like conscious decision to start modeling as a child and yes. stuff like that. And I think she looks back at these, you know, these modeling ads. Uh, she looks back at uh, these movies. And for her, it's very great because this is what got her to this point in life. Yeah. You know, she, uh, she, she's where she's at because of these things that are very gray, very dark sided again. Um, yeah. That's but, exactly the word this is gray. And I think, and, and so for her, it, it, it's, she can't be as objective as somebody looking from the outside. Well, in this scene, you really see it on her face. Yeah. How like, she's just not sure. She almost like looks is looking at her daughters like I'm not even sure how I feel about my own life and and you know things that have happened in my life. It almost looks like she is like it it just has me thinking maybe she hasn't entirely processed or isn't even able to entirely process everything, right? Um and that's not for us to sit here and say oh she needs to sit down and process, but I think Drew Barrymore really said it the best is that everything just looks great to them. You know, they, yeah. they kind of, it's really hard to process something when everything does look gray. Well, the, the, they did say it's easier to look at it through the lens of a mother of young daughters. Yes, that was a really and, good point too. And, and, and when they look at it that way, they can see where it's, it's easier not, yeah, to it's, understand because they could never imagine putting their daughters in those situations. In those situations. Exactly. Yeah. I loved this documentary. I'm really like interested in reading her books on um, postpartum and, and the one about her and her mother, you know, I'm not so much interested in reading about on my own, the Brooke Shields college story. I don't know. I, piece. I, I, we can do a trilogy. <laughs> <laughs> trilogy. I did love a trilogy. Um, I love her. I love this woman. And, and, uh, it's it's much easier for us on the outside to be like, oh, this was done to you, this happened to you, this happened to you, right? And then when you're in it, when it's her story and she's thinking about it, that's where it's really interesting because it does get a little bit more gray and it does get a little bit more um, complicated in her mind. You know, we can say an old an old man shouldn't have been kissing you when you were twelve years old, and she's like, well, he gave me. Really, you know, he he really made me feel comfortable at that moment. He said, "This doesn't count." You know, it's mm -hmm. just like this kind of like push and pull of of her story is really fascinating to me. I highly recommend it. Everybody going and checking out this yeah. documentary, Pretty Baby, two episodes, one hour each on Hulu. And then also, if you want more Brooke Shields, A Castle for Christmas, A on Castle Netflix. for Christmas on Netflix. <laughs> on Netflix, and we sat there and we watched the whole damn movie too. Yeah, we did, Christmas. and we, we were like, <laughs> we were like screaming during that. We got really into it. We did get into it. Oh, we I feel like the, over for I that. felt like there was a deleted scene or something. I know. Uh, I'm not. I'm not going to get into the. We were like, "There's a it. subplot. We know it. There is a subplot, <laughs> but they, they, they didn't like include it. it. Out, yeah. I want. I want the subplot. <laughs> okay. When are we getting a castle for uh, Christmas too? That's what I'm asking. I don't know. When am I going to get another one of these cocktails? It's really good. The Blue Lagoon. Um. All right, guys. Make sure you go on. Uh, if you're listening on podcast, make sure you give us a five star rating. If you are watching on uh, on YouTube, on YouTube, make sure to like. Give comment, us a thumbs up. And let us know what you, if you've watched the documentary, let us know what you think about it. And uh, if you haven't, it, what do you know about Brooke Shields? So let us know. Yeah, and, and, uh, and let us know what you want us to cover. More Brooke Shields, Drew Barrymore? Yeah, always, always list those recommendations down below, and uh, we will catch you on the flip side. What do you say? Adios. Adios, gentle Adios, viewers. Gentle viewers.